from this. Atmospheric scientists can measure the absorption of heat by these different gases using an instrument called a spectrometer. Energy from the sun, including visible light and invisible ultraviolet and infrared radiation, is spread out across a spectrum, enabling scientists to measure the wavelengths that are absorbed. When energy is absorbed, it creates gaps in the sun's spectrum, which appear as dark bands in the visible part of the spectrum. However, nearly all the energy absorbed by atmospheric gases occurs outside of the visible spectrum, in the ultraviolet and infrared ranges. Now for the really heady stuff. We need a more detailed graph, a more scientific graph. Bring out the multispectral atmospheric radiation transmission graph. Bill, did you get that off of Wikipedia? Oh, Bill. In order to understand this graph, we first have to divide it in half. That's not exactly what I had in mind. The left side shows the incoming shortwave radiation from the sun that passes down through the atmosphere. This is called the solar window. The right side shows the outgoing longwave radiation from the Earth that passes out of the atmosphere. This is known as the atmospheric window. These windows are where the atmosphere is transparent to certain wavelengths of energy. You know, window, glass, transparent. I think we get it, Bill. The incoming energy from the sun includes ultraviolet, visible light, and the shorter end of the infrared spectrum called the near-infrared and short-wave infrared. But as you can see, the peak energy transmission takes place in the visible spectrum. This incoming energy is absorbed by the Earth and re-radiated as outgoing energy consisting almost entirely of long-wave infrared radiation. Notice there are gaps in the spectrum of the incoming radiation and the outgoing radiation falls off abruptly on each side instead of forming a smooth curve. These wavelengths of energy are absorbed or scattered by the atmosphere and correspond to those dark bands you see beneath me. This absorption and scattering take place mostly in the outgoing long wave radiation from the Earth. The absorbed energy is what causes greenhouse warming. Now let's compare the absorbing gases. Beam me down, Scotty. I seem to be shrinking. Well, water vapor by far accounts for most of the absorption on both sides of the graph, but especially of the longer infrared waves that radiate from the Earth's surface. Carbon dioxide has much smaller but still significant IR absorption bands. On the other side of the spectrum, the shorter ultraviolet waves of the sun are absorbed mostly by ozone in the stratosphere. A sizable portion of these rays are scattered by gases in the atmosphere. This protects us from the harmful, searing, flesh-cooking solar rays. Finally, there are trace gases like methane and nitrous oxide. Both are strong absorbers, but fortunately they make up just over two parts per million of the atmosphere. That's point zero 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 two one percent Hey! What happened to my legs? You know, it's always something. I I'm calling the police. Well, maybe I need an ambulance. My insurance will never cover this. all this absorption of heat by atmospheric gases, you may be wondering why the Earth doesn't continue to heat up over time. The Earth maintains a fairly even temperature,
because the atmosphere constantly loses heat to outer space. The total incoming radiation is in approximate equilibrium with the total outgoing radiation. I guess you can say that when it comes to energy, the Earth keeps a balanced budget. You scientist! If you think all this is too complicated, and only scientists with special equipment can measure the greenhouse effect, you might be right. In order to make these measurements, you need a non-contact, broadband, spectral radiation pyrometer, <laughs> otherwise known as a $40 infrared thermometer. Infrared thermometers are used to measure temperature at a distance. Astronomers and meteorologists use satellite-based instruments to measure planetary and atmospheric temperatures. There are thousands of industrial and scientific applications. If you have an IR thermometer at home or in your classroom, you can do the same experiment that we will be doing here. Most thermometers have a pistol grip. This one has a flexible neck that makes it easier to reach out of the way places. Nice goose. The sensor is here at the end of the neck. When I point it at an object, the thermometer gives the surface temperature. Uh, that's about 24 degrees Celsius. Bill's neck. 30.2. Spike, 32 degrees Celsius. Brick wall, 43.2 Celsius. Like visible light rays, infrared radiation can also reflect off of shiny surfaces. You can take the temperature of this cold pack by pointing the infrared thermometer at the foil surface. Shiny. The infrared radiation from the cold pack reflects off the foil. The temperature here is about negative 6.2 degrees Celsius. This thermometer has a spot size of 8 to 1. That means if I'm 8 centimeters away, the sensor sees and measures a circular area 1 centimeter wide. If I'm 8 meters from an object, the sensor sees and measures an area one meter across. And if I'm eight kilometers away, the sensor measures a circular area one kilometer wide. Now there's one feature on this thermometer that makes it easy to point and shoot. It has a built-in laser pointer. Unfortunately, I found it to be rather wimpy. So I decided to make a few uh, enhancements, shall we say? Just a few more adjustments here. And I think we've got it. Bill, lasers are dangerous. Are you sure this is safe? Not to worry, Rebecca. I've only increased the power by a few thousand watts. Are you sure you know what you're doing? Don't I always? Okay, last time you said that, we almost blew up uh, half the... But this time is different. I hope so. Don't get us arrested again. Increasing the power to maximum. <laughs> So sorry. In science, a hypothesis must be verified by experiments. If the greenhouse effect is real, we should be able to detect and measure the radiation from greenhouse gases in the air, especially water vapor, by pointing this IR thermometer straight up into a clear sky. Oh my, it, it can't be. It's off, it's off the scale. There's, there's no heat up there. The, the hypothesis is false. I thought you said this would work. You are still paying me for eight hours. Uh, well, uh, that completes our experiment. Thank you for joining us today. Stop! 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 
Just kidding. The IR thermometer actually shows a temperature of minus 15.2 degrees Celsius caused by long wave radiation from greenhouse gases. Scientists call this IR energy from the sky downwelling radiation as opposed to the upwelling radiation from the Earth's surface. Since the atmosphere is also heated by direct contact with the Earth's surface and by rising currents of warm air, in other words by convection, you would expect that the IR thermometer will measure all of the heat up there, not just the heat produced by greenhouse gases. But a recent study using broadband IR thermometers like this one has shown that the IR radiation emitted by water vapor alone is so strong that it overwhelms the signal given off by other gases, even carbon dioxide. In fact, the IR temperature, when taken straight up in a clear sky, corresponds directly to the amount of water vapor up there. So a higher IR temperature means potentially more precipitation will fall if it condenses.